Um, just a few announcements for you. Um, Anna and I did have a COVID test on Friday, and we are negative, which is very good. Uh, so that gives us the, uh, I know, it gives us the opportunity to, uh, to praise with you this morning and uh, for me to be able to preach this morning. And so I'm very grateful for that. Um, Paul and Beth uh, have, their, have not gotten their test results back yet, but they have been tested. And so we'll know a little more um, whenever they announce that. And you'll probably get a phone tree, I'm sure, uh, whenever they do that. Um, this morning, a few announcements for you. Uh, Anna and I also, let me just tell you, Anna and I are wearing masks uh, today uh, to protect my mom uh, in order for us to go to Thanksgiving with her. Uh, Anna and I are just being very careful. Uh, my mom has four comorbidities uh, with COVID. Uh, my mom has MS and several other things that make her very vulnerable uh, to COVID. And uh, so we're just protecting her today. So I will be wearing a mask after we get finished today. Uh, but if you want to come talk to me, I am more than happy to talk to you. Uh, just a few announcements for you this morning. Thank you so much to Amy Hendricks and all who were involved uh, with the Thanksgiving meal. Uh, it was a very good success. It's the first time uh, that we have given out more to-go boxes than those who were present. Um, and I think that is due to COVID. Uh, it is one of those COVID firsts. Uh, so anyway, thank you so much, Miss Amy, for all that you did for that and everybody else who helped with that as well. Uh, Anna and I did a little drive-by in the parking lot to get our food and then went home and enjoyed it. So um, Leslie uh, will not be in the office on Wednesday, but I will be in the office until lunchtime on Wednesday. If you need to drop by and do anything at the church, uh, she is going to be on vacation that day. Um, the nursery is happening right now at 1030. And so if you have somebody that needs to go there, please let them go. Uh, the Sanctuary Sunday School class is meeting in here today at 4 o'clock, um, and there will be a Zoom Sunday School class with Paul and Beth, so if you want to see them tonight, they will be on Zoom at 6 o'clock, and uh, the link is on the website. Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Packing uh, has been a great success this year. Uh, last Sunday evening, y'all packed 519 shoeboxes. That is incredible. Uh, thank you so much for participating uh, in that. But also, the total shoebox count, and there may be an updated one as of this morning, but last night when I texted Miss Michelle, uh, the total was 5,065. And so that is incredible. Uh, more, than, more than exceeded our goal. Uh, this year. Um, and I just want you to know that 5,065, that may be a great number to us, but each one of those kids, not only are they getting Christmas presents, which is great and all, but they are getting, each of them has the opportunity to hear uh, the gospel in the sharing of that. And so that is a huge, that is a huge, huge thing um, in the world. And so we're very grateful uh, for all of that. Uh, the last day for OCC drop-off is tomorrow from 1 to 6 p.m. So if you have any shoeboxes that you have not yet dropped off, please be sure to go and do that. There will be no Wednesday morning Bible study uh, this week or, um, or youth group on Wednesday night uh, because of Thanksgiving. Uh, the membership information meeting that was scheduled for today is going to have to be rescheduled. Uh, and then we are having a youth Christmas party on December the 13th of 2020, and uh, that is at 7 o'clock. The party will be held at, lo at the local Q Family Restaurant off Haywood, Haywood Road in Greenville. Uh, the van will leave the church at 6.30 if you need a ride. Uh, bring a $10 gift for the White Elephant Gift Exchange. That will be right after we do Christmas caroling, and so hopefully we can just transition uh, into our party after that. Uh, Paul announced to you a couple weeks ago about the school Christmas ministry that he's thinking about and uh, something that we want to do as a church and something that we've been praying about in terms of getting into our middle and elementary schools more um, is Paul has had this great idea um, to get, put a $5 gift card and a handwritten note in the hand of every child at Dacusville Elementary and Middle School. Now that is huge. Uh, that's a big thing for us to do. And uh, one thing that that very much requires and what Paul has talked about to us before um, is that we need donations for that. And so if you would like to donate to that ministry and uh, to make that happen at the elementary and middle schools, um, we need those donations by December the 6th. And if you want to give to that, please mark your envelope at school ministry or you can give online and mark it there. Um, we have several prayer needs this morning that we want to lift up, and uh, m most of them are associated with COVID. Uh, so Miss Ann Ard, she is continuing to recover from COVID. Uh, Greg Porter is COVID positive, and Miss Pam is being tested. Uh, Melissa Winkler and her father both are struggling with COVID right now. And uh, then we have Miss Emma Blakely, who is doing well after her hip surgery. Very good. Uh, we praise the Lord about that. So let's go to the Lord together as we uh, lift up these needs. Jesus, we come to you this morning grateful and thankful to be in your house and to be in this place of worship. Lord, every week we set this time aside uh, to come and to glorify your name, uh, to take a moment out of our busy lives and out of our busy weeks and ascribe glory to the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Lord, today as we worship, I pray that we would do so with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that we would love our neighbor as ourselves. Lord, today we lift up these prayer needs for you. All of the ones who are struggling or dealing with COVID right now, Ms. Anar, Greg Porter, Melissa Winkler, we pray for all of them. We pray that Pam is not, is not positive again, again. And then, Lord, we also thank you for Ms. Emma as she is uh, recovering from her hip surgery. Lord, we ask all of these things in your precious name, knowing uh, that you are working all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purposes. Lord, answer prayer as you see fit because you are sovereign and you are good. Lord, today, help us to worship in a way that honors you and glorifies you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Um, as uh, Dalton just prayed, we certainly are grateful and thankful to be in God's house and giving him honor and glory and praise this morning. Um, you know, as I was listening to him prayer and pray, and that was kind of his introduction into his prayer, I just wonder, is there anyone here that would like to share something they're thankful for? And don't all speak at once, okay? You can take turns. We'll take a minute or two. Negative COVID test. Negative COVID test. Praise God for that. You'd hate to have done, done all that yourself, right? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. Other, I saw some hands. Yes, Karen. I'm, I'm thankful for the prayers of God's people. I have seen God answer some very specific prayer requests for my family this week, and I want to give him praise for that. Amen. God receives all the honor and glory for everything in our lives. Yes. Okay, now I know that probably if they're recording this, some of these things you're not going to pick up. But uh, listen, we're giving honor and glory to God for just a multitude of things. Girls, I think I saw one of your hands, didn't I? I didn't? <laughs> Surely you can think of something you're thankful for. Amen. Remembrance of what God has done for us and for others. Anybody else? Anybody else want to just say, hey, thank you, Lord? Yes, Vivian. I'm grateful for a great mighty God. Amen. Amen. Yes. I'm grateful my daughter, uh, four weeks ago, she was saved. And she was Praise saved. God for the, the <laughs> listen, it doesn't get any better than that, you know? It doesn't get any better than that. But that doesn't mean somebody else can't lift a voice of testimony for praise today. Anybody? Anybody? All right. Well, we're going to sing some worship songs. And if I better get on the right page or I'll be singing the wrong song. And uh, as we sing, let's think about all those things that God has done for us. Let's give him honor, glory, and praise and let's remember, just as we heard testify, the ultimate is that God saved our souls. He loved us so much. He came down to this earth. He became a man. He was the God man. He was all God. He was all man. But he came here because he loved us. He didn't have to. And he reconciled us to him through his death on the cross. His sinless life he was the only one that could be the sacrifice for me and for you. We have so much to be thankful for. Let's stand together and sing praises to him. <clears throat> A new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again. 
Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let there be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I'll worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I'll worship your holy name. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father Son and Holy Ghost. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give thanks. The Bible has a lot to say about how we spend our time. It has a lot, of, a lot to say about who we spend our time with and what we spend our time doing. Uh, one thing that it says here in Psalm chapter 1 is that our company determines what's going on in our heart. And so I'd like for you to pay attention to that as I read Psalm chapter 1 today. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree who plants himself by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so. But they are like chaff that the wind drives away. 
Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Do you walk in the counsel of the wicked? Do you stand in the way of sinners? Do you sit in the seat of scoffers? Today I would ask that you forsake those things and instead plant yourself in the streams of living water. And the streams of living water is the Word of God, the preaching of His Word, and His people who go out and share the good news about who Jesus Christ is. Let's go to the Lord. Jesus, we pray today as we take time out of our week, devote intentional time to be in the house of God, listening to what you would have to say to us, Lord. Lord, today I pray that for everybody here, that we would be the kind of people who plant ourselves in streams of living water. That, Lord, we would not spend our time doing things that are not God-honoring. Lord, that we would not spend our time listening to those who do not honor you, but instead, Lord, that we would trust wholly in you and your wisdom and your righteousness. Today, Lord, as we have planted ourselves in this room, I pray that your streams of living water, the water of your word, would wash over us, it would cleanse us of sin, and Lord, it would make us more like you. Jesus, we lift all of these things in the gracious name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. I saw some of you start sit down. I saw some of you sitting down stand up. So I'm as confused as you are. What are we supposed to do next? We're supposed to continue singing praises to God, and we're going to sing together. We gather together. We gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. He chastens and hastens his will to make known the wicked oppressing now cease from distressing. Sing praises to his name, he forgets not his own. Beside us to guide us, our God with us joining, ordaining, maintaining his kingdom divine. So from the beginning, the fight we were winning, thou Lord was at our side, our glory be thine. All do extol thee, thou leader in battle, and praying that thou still our defender will be. Let thy congregation escape tribulation, thy name be ever praised, O Lord, make us free. You may be seated. And if you think I missed a note or two or timing on that one, you should have been here at the first service. You gotta know when to start the music because I always say something before I sing. Poor guy. You know, there's one thing you can be certain of when I'm up here. You never know what's going to happen. But I want you to know my heart wants to rejoice in what God has done for me. And what he's done for all of us, for each of us. And uh, I was asked some time ago to sing this song, and it's been several, several months. And um, this may not be looked at exactly like a Thanksgiving song. But this is a song about the God-man, all God, all man, and what he could do. And if you could just kind of imagine that you were on earth at the time that Jesus walked on this earth, and you heard the stories, you know, it wasn't on Facebook or the internet or, you know, nobody's texting you or everything. You're hearing this stuff about this guy, 
that could do all these miracles and could do all these things. And, you know, nobody knew he was God. They thought he was just a man. But they learned that he was the God man. And this song is about, I know a man who can. I can't take a heart that's broken, make it over again. But I know a man who can. I can't take a soul that's sin sick, make it white as the snow. But I know a man who can. Some call him Savior, the Redeemer of all men. I call him Jesus, for he's my dearest friend. If you feel no one can help you and your life is out of hand, well, I know a man who can. I can't walk upon the water or calm the troubled sea. But I know a man who can. I can't cause blind eyes to open or make the lame to walk again. But I know a man who can some call him savior the redeemer of all men i call him jesus for he's my dearest friend if you feel no one can help you and your life is out of hand well i know a man who can oh yes i know a man who can jesus Savior, Redeemer, and Friend. Well, hello. I am uh, honored to bring the word of the Lord to you today. If you will turn with me to Habakkuk, uh, the book of Habakkuk. Um, chapter 3 is where we are going to be today. Now, I know that Habakkuk is your favorite book to read in all of the Bible, right? <laughs> we play this awesome game in youth. How many of you as kids uh, had Bible drills in Sunday school? Okay, for those of you who don't know, a Bible drill is where you kind of stand in a room and, or sit in a room. Somebody calls out a verse or a chapter or a book chapter and verse, and you have to find it, and then you stand up and read it. Uh, anyway, some of us did that as kids. I did not do that as a kid. And so um, I kind of am jealous that other people can do that faster than me. And so I have started doing something with our youth, and that we play extreme Bible drills every Wednesday. Okay, now I know that it may not sound fun, but it is. And here's why. Extreme being that it has several new elements. Okay, on the one hand, I can put something up that's very normal. 
okay? Uh, I can put up like John chapter one, verse two, okay? And they have to turn to it and they're all excited and Anna beats them all the time. It's really fun. Um, and then the second thing is I can tell them something that's incorrect. So often it's like second hesitations, chapter four, or um, uh, Habakkuk chapter four, which if you look down, doesn't exist. And uh, in response to something that's incorrect, they're to go wrong, okay? And they're to say that out loud, and that's how they get that point. And then the last thing is the hardest thing, and I'll put out like a Bible trivia or some sort of Bible um, story, and they have to go find it. And so this last week or two weeks ago, I was really mean. I did the writing on the wall, um, and they were all like, what? even know that I've heard that story. And so I'm going, okay. Uh, it's in Daniel for those of you uh, who don't know. But um, we've been playing that and they love it. Okay. They're so competitive at it. And uh, I love doing it. Uh, and sometimes I love to pull these little books out like Habakkuk. So Habakkuk, Nahum, Joel, uh, Amos, uh, Hezekiah, Zephaniah, all those. I love pulling them out uh, because none of, they all go wrong, like it doesn't exist, but it does exist. Um, anyway, our kids are learning, y'all. Uh, it's really good. So anyway, this morning I want to read to you from Habakkuk. Uh, Habakkuk is a, a fantastic uh, little book, uh, and uh, I, I want us to sit there today. Before I read the chapter that we're going to be sitting in today, I want to, uh, to kind of tell you the background. Since this is just a three-chapter book, um, it's kind of important for us to know what's going on before uh, chapter three happens. So in the beginning, you have this man. His name is Habakkuk, and he is a prophet. Um, and he is kind of serving in between the first exile of the uh, Israelite people and the second exile. So the Babylonians had come, taken them, and then they'd come back. Um, and this is right before the second exile is about to happen. So you have this man, Habakkuk, and uh, he's kind of like me. How many of you like to ask the question, why? Okay. Let me ask a better question. How many parents in this room do your kids ask you why? Okay. Is it an annoying question? Most of the time, yes. Anna believes that I use the, I use the word why way too often, and I use it out of context. Okay, so like, uh, let's just imagine a situation where she says, I want to go eat here, and I'll say why, and she doesn't like that. Because that's, that's just, just like, mm, that doesn't follow, right? Um, this man, Habakkuk, is a person who likes to ask the question why. In fact, he is the only prophet in all of the Bible that asks why of God. Okay? He asks why of God. And so this morning I want us to look and I want us to understand what Habakkuk asked and how he questioned God. In the beginning, this kind of chapter one area, uh, Habakkuk asks God, Lord, I see Israel doing so many wicked things. I see so much sin in the world around me. God, here it is. Why are you not doing anything? Okay, fair question. Fair question. Kind of haughty to ask of God. But he asks, God, why? Why are you not doing anything? And the Lord responds. He said, I am doing something. This is towards the end of chapter 1. I am doing something. I am sending an evil people, the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. I'm sending them to take you over. I'm sending a wicked people to deal with your wickedness. And then Habakkuk backs up a little bit. He says, God, how can you, a holy God, use a wicked people to judge us when they are more wicked than we are? And God says, I am not just the judge of Israel. I am the judge over all people. All people stand wicked before me until they repent of their sin and follow after me. That is where we kind of run into this end result of what Habakkuk does. Now, there are two things that Habakkuk could do in chapter 3. Number one, he could do this. He could say, well, Lord, I don't agree with you. How many of you have ever prayed a prayer and expected God to answer it the way you thought he should answer it? And he didn't answer it that way. Right? He could have answered that way. But Habakkuk does something different. Habakkuk has a different response to the Lord than we would think. One that is different than the way that you and I may react sometimes. 
And so today I want us to pick up in chapter 3. Now I'm going to warn you before I read it, this little first introduction part of prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to Shigoanoth. Okay? Now that word, Shigoanoth, shows us that this is a particular kind of Hebrew poetry. Okay, it's only found in one other place in the Old Testament, uh, which, is a pro- which is a psalm that David wrote. But basically what this is, it means a poem of rambling. Okay? It is a poem of rambling. How many of you ramble in your prayers a little bit? Okay? To the point where you may be laying in bed praying, and then all of a sudden you're not awake anymore. Right? So kind of the rambling prayer. This is about the closest thing that we have in the Bible to like freestyle rap. Right? This is about the closest that we have in the Bible to that. And so, uh, one thing that I want us to look at today, and as we read, I want you to think about the Lord's power and what He has done in Israel up to this point. We're going to focus in on verses 17 through 19, but I do want to read the whole chapter for you. So let's start in chapter 1, or chapter 3, verse 1. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, according to Shigenonoth. O Lord, I have heard report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came out of Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens and the earth was full of His praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from His hand and there He veiled His power. Before Him went pestilence and plague followed at His heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and he shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Cushion in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your wrath against the rivers or your indignation against the sea? When you rode on your horses on your chariot of salvation... You stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their place. At the light of your arrows as they sped, at the flash of your glittering spear, you marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters I hear, and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon us who invade us. And here's where I want us to focus in. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places to the choir master with stringed instruments. I have a question for you today. If all of the things, the material things of this world, if they were all gone this Thanksgiving, would you rejoice in the Lord? If everything that you appreciate about this world, if it were gone, would you rejoice? In the Lord. I want us to look at these last three verses of Habakkuk chapter 3, and I want us to know several things. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor the fruit be on the vines. These first little two phrases in here, they have something very specific to do with the Israelite agricultural calendar. Okay? Their almanac. All right? So, in this particular time of the year and what he references here, this is what happens as the very last part of the Israelite agricultural calendar. This was not something that they relied on for income. It was something that they enjoyed. How many of you like sweets? Right? They didn't have confection chocolates. Okay? They had fruit. Right? And they loved fruit. And at the end of the season, the fruit would bloom. The figs and the fruit trees. All right? And what he says here is that 
this is not going to happen. We know that from the beginning, and when I explained to you kind of the context of Habakkuk, we know that there is a warring nation who is coming to destroy them. So when Habakkuk says, though the fig tree should not blossom nor the fruit be on the vines, and the other four things that he talks about here, he's not saying if it happens, he's saying when it happens. When this stuff is taken away. And so the first thing I want you to see here is though the fig tree should not blossom, nor the fruit be on the vines. And then you can skip down to verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Though this should not happen, what does that have to do with? It has to do with want. It has to do with want. Would you, believer, would you rejoice in the Lord if your wants were not met? Would you rejoice in the Lord if your wants were not met? All of us have things that we want. All of us have things that we need. The basic things that we need are very easy for us to talk about. Things like food, water, shelter, those kinds of things. But things that we want are much different. We currently live in the most affluent nation in all of the world. Meaning that we can have anything that we want on our phone. At the touch of a button in two days. Maybe one if you live close enough to Greenville, right? Maybe one. Amazon Prime is a wonderful thing. And yet, what if the things that we want weren't able to happen? What if Thanksgiving, the things that we want, were no longer included in our have list? Would you still rejoice in the Lord? The second thing that Habakkuk points out here, and these next two little phrases, though the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food, they represent the other part of the agricultural calendar. I'm pretty sure there are seven different things that they represent. These two things represent all of the rest of the calendar. So all of the things that they actually lived on day to day. The olive failing would result in no monetary gain for an Israelite household. The other thing, the fields yielding no food, yielding no food. No money, no food. Do you like that picture? Yeah, I don't either. That's not real good. Here's what Habakkuk is saying. Though the produce of the olive fail, though money is not an option and not present, and second, though the fields yield no food, though there's no food for me to eat, the fridge is empty and it's really empty. It's not the empty that you think it is empty. It's the real empty. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. So, first... What if your wants are not met? But second, what if your needs are not met? What if your basic needs were not met? Would you rejoice in the Lord? These are some hard questions that Habakkuk is bringing up. Let's look at the third. This this set of next phrases. Though the flock be cut off from the field, and there be no herd in the stalls. Growing up, I heard stories of my great-grandfather, uh, my dad's dad died when he was nine years old. And so my, gr- my great-grandfather was my dad's dad. Okay? And so growing up, any time that they needed anything, let's say that my grandmother needed new cars on her tire, if you didn't have the money, you would go ask my great-grandfather, and he would sell a cow. <laughs> right? You all understand that? We'll go sell a cow. A cow is something that you purchase for pretty relatively cheap as a calf, and it grows up and you can sell it for more money. Okay, it's a good investment. And so basically what he's saying here, when the flock is cut off from the fold, and there's no herd in the stalls, my future security is not taken care of. For all of us in this room here today, we pay into something called Social Security. Every single check that you've ever made in your whole life will have that, unless you're a minister and you opted out of it, which I did not. So, something that we all do is we are preparing by working for our future security. That makes sense for everybody? What if that was gone? What if all that which for you worked your whole life was gone? What if there wasn't a cow in the pasture to sell for tires? What if your future was insecure And a big question mark. I don't like question marks in the future, right? And I know you don't either. We plan and we worry about question marks that are in the future. 
This picture that Habakkuk paints here, it's a little bleak, right? You can't have anything that you want. You can't have anything that you need. And you're not going to have anything to secure your future. Man, what a Thanksgiving sermon, right? Ain't going to have none of it. But once again, we come to verse 18. Yet, even though this is going to happen without a doubt, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. And I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Where do you find your joy? Is your joy found in the things that you own, the things that you have, the things that you want, and the things that you will have one day? Or do you find your joy in the Lord? You see, when Jesus taught us to pray in the New Testament, and He said these words, Give us this day our daily bread, Jesus never promised that your tomorrow was going to be okay. Jesus asked that you would rely on the Lord for what you would have right now. And so what if it was all gone? Would you still be the person who said, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord? Lord, give me this day my daily bread. What you rejoice in says a lot about you. And I think we need to mention here, what is rejoicing? What is this joy that Habakkuk is speaking of here? Well, obviously, even though all these things are going to happen, joy cannot have anything to do with what I want, what I need, and my future. Do you get it? Joy cannot have anything to do with what I want, what I need, or my future. Period. And so it has to be something different. It has to be something greater than that. That despite your circumstances, despite what you're going through, despite what you're in, despite your health, despite anything in your life that could go wrong, God is the one that you will rejoice in. If you had nothing, zero, you can still rejoice. Did you get that? If you had nothing, like literally nothing, could you rejoice in the Lord? What you take joy in matters. If you'll look with me up just a little bit um, in chapter 2, verse 18, it says this, What profit is an idol when its maker has shaped it? A metal image, a teacher of lies. For its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, Awake, to a silent stone, arise. Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, but there is no breath in it at all. And the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. When the Israelites were running after the Egyptian soldiers and they were up against, and the area is two mountains and water, and the, and the Egyptians are coming this way, right? They're stuck. Their back is against the water. They're crying out to the Lord, and they're saying, Moses, why did you do this to us? You just brought us out in the desert all to die. And Moses steps into the water, staff, the whole thing, and the water splits, and they walk through on dry ground. Okay, that's a great thing. They get on the other side, and not like two weeks later, Moses goes up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. And while he's gone, he leaves Israel in the command of... Um, man, I just lost his name. Aaron, sorry. Man, I totally lost that. Lost it, in, left it in the command of Aaron. And Aaron, when Moses comes down, they're all worshiping this gold calf. And Aaron has the audacity to say... Oh, we, we just got all our gold together, threw it in the fire, and a cow popped out. No, that's not true. That's not what happened. Okay, they made a cow, and they all were worshiping the cow. Moses broke the Ten Commandments, all right, reasonably. But they had just walked through an ocean, like part of the ocean, to get to this next place. And then all of a sudden, they turned their back on the Lord. Folks, we do that. We live in a time when we know who Jesus is. We know what God has done to remedy the sin problem. 
And yet too often we make our own idols and we turn to the things that we want to find security in in order to find it. We rely on the things that we can have, the things we can make, and the things that we want in the future to sustain us. And we let that be our identity. We let that be every part of us. And so our wants, our needs, and our future security become our idols in the same way that they did in Habakkuk's day. I don't think we're much different at all. We would trade the glory of the everlasting God for a creation of the creature any day. What if we get to this point? We get to this point where we painted the worst picture ever, and instead of saying, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, what if Habakkuk had said, woe is me? What if he had looked inward on himself, been selfish, and said, oh my goodness, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. I'm so pitiful. That would not be Scripture. It would not be what the Bible talks about. There are several times that woe is me is said in the Bible, and it is not talking about how pitiful you are for your own circumstances and sin. Instead, if, we, if you want to turn over to Isaiah chapter 6, I'll show you what woe is me should be. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He saw it. Sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, the train of His robe filled the temple, Above him stood the seraphim, and this will be scary. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another, and they all said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, now this is, this is Isaiah standing here watching this scene, and this is what he says, Woe is me. For I am lost, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The only time, folks, that we are to say, woe is me, is not in a situation where you lose everything. No, it is when we see God and we realize our state before a holy God. Sinners, wretched sinners before a holy, utterly different God than us. That is the only time to say, woe is me. Where do you find your joy? What do you glory in? And then last we see this. Verse 19 of Habakkuk chapter 3. God, this is his truth claim at the end of his rambling prayer. God, the Lord, he is my strength he makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. In Luke chapter 17, where we looked last week, we saw, heard a story about ten lepers outside of the colony of God, outside of the nation of Israel. They called out to Jesus and they said, Teacher, heal us. And Jesus said, Go. They all turned around and as they were going to the priest, they were healed. And only one man turned around, came back, fell at Jesus' feet, and worshipped Him. Only one. Only one for the restoration of His life. Folks, today, your strength cannot be found in anything that you can make, see, or do. Nothing. Your strength cannot be found in an idol. Your strength can only be found in God the Lord. As Habakkuk says here, he is your only source of strength. In fact, I would go back to Solomon where Solomon talks about how he did everything under the sun and all is vanity. In that same way, anything that you rely on in this life other than the saving grace of Jesus Christ in your life is vanity and it will never satisfy you. We have a satisfaction problem. And it is that everything that we look to in this life to satisfy us will never do so. Never, ever, ever. The only thing that will satisfy is the blood of Jesus Christ. The only thing. The second thing he says is this, He makes my feet like the deer's. 
In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it's one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. For freedom, Christ has set you free so that you would no longer submit yourselves to a yoke of bondage. Folks, in having the salvation that only belongs to the Lord, you are free from sin. Whereas before, you could never choose anything other than your own sin. Even your good acts were filthy rags before a holy God. For freedom... For freedom, Christ has set you free. And when Habakkuk talks about your feet will be like the deer, you ever seen a deer prance around? They don't look like they have any weight on them whatsoever. There is a freedom found in the people of Christ when they trust in who Jesus is. There is a freedom found when we no longer have to submit to the heavy yoke of sin and slavery and we trust in the light and easy yoke of Jesus. My burden is easy and my yoke is light. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He will make you like the deer. For freedom, Christ has set you free. And then last, He makes me tread on high places. We become, when we are saved, we become joint heirs with Christ. And we are seated in the heavenly places with Him. Lifted up. Can I tell you today? All three of these things that Habakkuk says, he did not know who Jesus was. Jesus had not been born. He had not been named. And yet he believed He was coming. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 19. He, Christ, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer. He treads on my high places. And so, I want you to see a few things today. I have three things that I want to tell you. Number one. Remember God's wondrous deeds. Remember God's wondrous deeds. In the beginning of Habakkuk chapter 3, we see all of this wonderful poetry that Habakkuk writes, talking about the history that the Lord has with Israel. He calls first, not to hysteria at the, what's going to be happening, but he calls and remembers history. Not hysteria, history. Remember what the Lord has done in the past. If you want a good place to go for this, in Scripture, it is Psalm 105. If you want to read it later, it's a very good option for you. In Psalm 105, uh, it is pretty much a poetic discourse of all that God did in Israel up until the point when the writer writes. And it says this in the very beginning, Oh, give thanks to the Lord and call upon His name. Make known His deeds among the peoples. Sing to Him, sing praises to Him, tell of all His wondrous works. Glory in His name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in His strength. Seek His presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that He has done, His miracles and the judgments He uttered. O offspring of Abraham, His servant, children of Jacob, the chosen ones. Folks, we are the chosen ones. That is written about in Psalm chapter 5. That is us. That is the believers of today. And all of these things, all of this history is for us. The other thing is in testimony. In Mark chapter 5, verse 19, we hear the end of the horror story of the New Testament. The end of the horror story of the New Testament. There is a man. He is possessed by a legion of demons. He is naked, running around, screaming, breaking chains in a graveyard. If that's not a horror story, then I don't know what is. It is the worst story in all of the New Testament. And this man when all of the possible ails that could ail a human being, when he is relieved of them, what does he do? Jesus did not permit him to leave and come with him, but he said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. Folks, your testimony is important for this too how you act and react about what God has done in this world, and how you remember what the Lord has done in your whole life will do a lot for how you act in the world and how you respond to challenging circumstances. And the second thing is this. Rejoice, 
despite your circumstances. Now we have gone through this in the very beginning in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. We see that we are to rejoice, we are to spring up and take joy only in Christ, despite not having our wants, despite our lacks, and despite our future security. That's what we're supposed to do. Despite our want, despite our lack, and despite our future security. This is much easier said than done. This is much easier said than done. Despite having, not having what I want, despite not having what I need, and despite not having any future security, would you rejoice in the Lord? Would you say, yet I will rejoice in the Lord? And the third thing is this. Repeat praises to God. Repeat praises to God. We see this in the very last statement, his truth claims about who God is. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. That's like a song we would sing today, right? We rejoice in life and in strength. There is no idol in this whole world that can give life to your mortal body. It is only the Lord. Even the strength of the Babylonians who are coming in to destroy Israel in this time, even their strength will fail. Their strength is their God currently, but their strength will fail. But not, not Habakkuk's. Even though he knows he's about to come and be conquered, the Lord is his strength. Second, we rejoice in our freedom. For freedom, Christ has set you free. I always think about um, the, oh man, freedom, like the movie. I can't remember. Um, Wallace. Anyway, freedom. For freedom, Christ has set you free. That you would no longer submit yourselves to a yoke of bondage. No longer be in sin, stuck there, grounded, weighed down. But instead you'd be like the deer and you'd be free, bounding. Then third, we rejoice in our salvation. Y'all, Jesus saved us. It's about the best thing I could ever tell you. Despite want, despite need, despite future security, Jesus saved you, and that's what you get to hold on to. Hmm. And then last, there's this last little line that I love, and I'm going to get Anna to come play. At the very end, it says, to the choir master with string instruments. He said, man, this is good enough to sing about. And today, as we uh, have a time of closing, I would invite you to repeat praises back to God. Despite your circumstances, despite what's going on in your life, despite not having what you want, what you need, your future, despite anything that you have going on, you can stand and sing today and praise the Lord for what He has done for you. I have a little story to read to you as Anna plays. I cried in the first service, so let me not do that. The man who wrote this song, Horatio Spafford, knew something about life's unexpected challenges. He was a successful attorney and a real estate investor who lost a great fortune in the great Chicago fire of 1871. Around that same time, about a week and a half later, his four-year-old son died of scarlet fever. Thinking a vacation would do his family some good, he sent his wife and four daughters on a ship to England, planning to join them after he finished some business at home. However, as they were crossing the Atlantic, the ship was involved in a terrible collision and it sank. More than 200 people died that day, four of whom were his daughters. His wife did survive. Her name was Anna. Upon arriving in England, she sent a telegram to her husband. And this is what she said, Saved alone, what do I do? 
Horatio immediately set sail for England. At one point during his voyage, the captain of the ship, aware of the tragedy that had struck the Spafford family, summoned Horatio to tell him that they were now passing over the spot where the shipwreck had occurred. As Horatio thought about his daughters, words of comfort filled his heart and mind, and he wrote them down, and they'd become our well-beloved hymn. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, Thou hast taught me to say, It is well, it is well with my soul. Perhaps we cannot always say that things are always going to be well in life. There will always be storms. There will always be tragedies. But our faith in a loving, great God, and with His divine help, we can confidently say, it is well, it is well with my soul. So if you would, stand and sing with us as we sing, It is well with my soul. ready for him to return no more sorrow no more pain all joy in the presence of Jesus yet I will trust in the Lord it's a good Bible verse to memorize and it's just half of the verse 
yet I will trust in the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace.